Welcome to the Agent to Investor podcast, where we discuss the agent side of real estate investing. We'll be talking about the successes, the failures, and all in between. My name is Nico Garcia. I am a local real estate investor here based out of Montgomery County and also a local investor friendly agent. Uh, that's a mouthful. And I am, and I am joined by my co-host. Lana Bilek. I'm a Northern Virginia real estate agent and mostly out of state investor with my husband. And today's show is super special because it's not just Nico and I. We're actually here with Jael Thomas, who is going to tell us all of the, like, lo give us the lowdown on creative financing because her and her mom are like the queens in this area, probably more than this area of like creative finance. So I'm excited to like get into it. Thank you so much for having me, Anna and Nico. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm just excited that you all even considered having me here today. And I can't wait to share a lot of information with agents and investors. Exactly. Yeah, we, we're super excited to have you. And, and what we'll do is just a, a quick background, you know, where you come from. Um, what, what are you up to currently? Okay, so I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I'll take it all the way back to high school. Um, I started off with an entrepreneur mindset. So I started off in the 10th grade studying for my cosmetology license. By 11th grade, I was a licensed cosmetologist. I used that to support me all through college. My parents also were investors since 2006. So I was the administrative assistant for their investment company. They worked full-time jobs, so they didn't have a lot of time to dedicate to investing. So from there, I did a lot of different businesses. I was a server, bartender, and just could not figure out exactly what I wanted to do. So during COVID 2020, a lot of people got bored, including myself. So I started studying for my real estate license exam. And in 2021, I have become licensed in Virginia and Maryland. And since then, it's basically history. Been crushing it since then. That's right. Thank you. Initially, what brought you into investing, you said, was your parents that had investing. And then when you became a licensed real estate agent, like, did you know at that point that you were going to go into the investing side or did you just want to do like set buy and selling homes for other folks? So I actually got my license so that I had no cap on my income so that I could reinvest that money back into my investment properties. So really the reason behind getting my license was to invest in real estate, but I needed some upfront capital. So I thought until I found, you know, creative financing, but um, I really thought and within a year, I'm going to go hard. I'll be rich. I'll be helping first time home buyers and I'm going to be paid. Guess what, guys? Totally not the truth. Tried to do everything on my own. And it was a very, very hard year for me the first year. I barely made any money. But um, I did get several listings under contract. It just did not pan out. And then I realized that it was a need to help people more so than to get rich overnight in real estate. And so I got some of the hardest transactions I could have ever gotten just starting out. Reverse mortgage, people in pre-foreclosure, people who didn't know what to do next with their home. And I said, this is my niche, helping people navigate situations that are difficult. So now, because of that, people know that I'm the go-to person to figure things out for them that other people may not be able to. Yeah, most people don't know. Most agents have no idea how to figure out any of those things <laughs> that I've come yeah. across. Yeah, no, the transactions can be different every time you're dealing with a real estate transaction. I just deal dealt with my first foreclosure uh, uh, transaction, and that was its own journey. But we got to the finish line yesterday. So um, I just want to backtrack a little, J.O. Um, I can relate to you, you know, coming from a background uh, related in real estate. You know, my father has, uh, he did have a few rental properties uh, when I was really young. He's now currently like in uh, general contracting. So I learned a lot from him, uh, not only on the construction side, but, you know, looking at properties as investments. That's actually what got me into being an agent and getting me into real estate to begin with. Um, I know your parents are very much into real estate and, and you were uh, administrative for them. What, what role has that, you know, helped you with, with, you know, your, your future and what your current portfolio is? So um, I learned a lot and I learned everything that I didn't want to do. As I stated before, they had full-time jobs that were very demanding. So they could not dedicate a lot of time into the education piece of real estate. And that's what I recommend people do first is become educated partner with the right people, have resources that you can reach out to 
So they have bought a, a triplex in Baltimore, Maryland with tenants in it. And they were like, it's already cash flowing, all of these things, total nightmare. So, so many lessons learned, finally got the tenants out, decided we're going to gut it, renovate it and do rentals by the bed because it was such a large property, absolutely huge property. Um, and it just never worked out. So by the time uh, 2020 came, they were finally over it and sold it in 2021 and started from scratch. So since then, we have been able to acquire 90 doors. Wow, 90 doors. I know Baltimore is hard because they have so many regulations in place. Yes. So I guess, is that a lesson? Like check the regulations yeah. before you buy in also, an area? Also, Baltimore is like <laughs> its own entity. You have to work with people in Baltimore. You have to have relationships or you are going to get shut out left and right. Mm -hmm. And I always said, I'll never buy another property in Baltimore, but I have one because it came and fell in my lap creatively. So and it's going great, but it's a single family home in a great neighborhood by golf course. So it's a big difference. You got to know the area and the information and have the education before making those purchases. Yep. Street by street, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. All right. So creative financing, like that's your jam. Like what, what does that mean for like the person that doesn't know what creative financing is? Because they're probably just thinking I go to a bank and I get a loan. My watch is talking. My watch doesn't understand what creative financing is. Yeah. That was so perfect. Yes. <laughs> creative financing is coming up with unique ways to help sellers out of difficult situations. Sometimes even buyers that are getting shut down by banks. It's a non traditional method that allows people to become homeowners or to move on to their next phase in life without necessarily going a traditional route using bank financing or qualifying for loans or selling it on the market with an agent. Now, agents, this doesn't cut you out of the deal. It's just giving your seller more options so that it's not a one size fits all. And we know that in real estate, every single transaction is different. So with creative financing, I can give my seller three to four options instead of just one. Yeah, keep a deal together that would have fallen apart with a traditional Absolutely. loan. Yeah, and that's I, what I realized. I I just love the word creative financing. It gets me like I'm like that sounds so cool. So you know, <laughs> I, when you first started as 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 in well, when I first started as a real estate agent, that you know most agents don't understand that they don't understand all these, and we'll go into uh, the different types of creative financing. But you know, most people, I would say ninety percent of ninety five percent of the people know how to get a home and it's based off of getting a loan from a bank the traditional way um and and buying it that way so when you when you're talking about creative financing it like like jail uh jail mentioned it just opens your toolbox to you know so many different ways to to buy homes because some people you know don't have a lot of equity and they can't sell it the traditional way and we'll, we'll go a little bit more into into the creative financing. But before we do that, I just wanted to, I know we spoke a little bit off camera, Jael, about, you know, your current portfolio. And you mentioned that you just closed on a on a pretty big unit down in uh, Atlanta. Do you mind sharing, you know, your, your current portfolio and your experience on, on uh, with real estate investing? Absolutely. So um, I just had the opportunity to be a part of a multifamily syndication as a general partner. And that means that I'm part of the asset management. I raise capital. And a lot of people don't know that you can invest in apartment buildings. It's basically just a pool of investors that put their money together and partners that came up with a solid business plan to increase the value of it and decrease the expenses and whatever that means. So it's looking at a property as a business instead of a comparable. So we were able to successfully raise capital and manage an asset that has 87 units five businesses attached with triple net leases one mile away from the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. And Ooh. we were done our first successful raise for accredited investors only. And I'm so proud, guys. I've been looking at multifamily properties for two years now with no success, but never give up because all of the ones we looked at were not the right ones. And then this opportunity fell in our laps because we were consistent and persistent. The other properties that we have are midterm rentals, and we purchased those creatively. And basically, the sellers were in trouble. We took over the properties, and we actually realized that there was a need for people who are displaced through insurance, 
coming to places as professors for three months, stuff like that. So our midterm rental is basically a corporate rental and they have to book it for 30 days plus. And they pay us a premium because it's pretty luxurious. It's accommodating. You have everything you need there. And um, it, it basically helps people save money with larger families besides getting three to four hotel rooms. They mm -hmm. only have to pay us for one house and everyone can stay together. I love that. I learned about that through Dr. Rachel. I can't remember her name. Her last name is, do you know who I'm talking about? Have you ever no. heard of Dr. Rachel? She is a pharmacist turned investor and her whole platform is doing that. And she does it in Georgia, a lot in Georgia because that's like Hollywood of the East Coast is Absolutely. like Atlanta. So do you do some of your midterm rentals with like Hollywood, like studios and stuff? If you have well, it. We haven't yet. So our sweet spot, we're super hyper niche. So we have ours are five bedrooms with at least three or more bathrooms. Okay. Because we know that we can sleep 12 to 14 people, two beds in each room, pull out couch downstairs, so many ways you can be creative because large families, it's really a need for them on Airbnb, Verbo, and all of that stuff. So that's our niche with MTR. But I would definitely look at studios and stuff. The location is the most important thing. Buy yep. hospitals, buy universities, near urban areas with amenities close by. All right. We'll have to do a different I, I, podcast about MTRs because I want to know more. I want to swap notes there. <laughs> yeah. I love the MTR strategy. It's something that I've been looking at one of uh, our properties. It's near three hospitals. So we're, we're, we'll have to talk more about mm -hmm. it, uh, JL, of, of things like that. Locations. That's right. That's right. Um, well, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to go do a deep dive on creative financing, all the different types of creative financing and give you a few examples. We're going to dive in and Jael, I need to think about this because I don't want to say your name wrong because I want to be respectful, especially of the Bible. Um, <laughs> don't. I don't want to be struck down. The rain clouds have passed, <laughs> but still. Um, so we're going to go in. And so can you tell us on a high level, like what are the most common forms of creative finance that someone may hear about or hear someone talk about? Absolutely. So the two most common forms of creative financing is seller finance and subject to. So I'm going to tell you just a high level definition of each one. Seller finance is when you come across a homeowner that owes nothing on their home. They are free and clear of a mortgage. And what we consider that person is to be our bank. So just like you make and get terms from the bank when you get a loan with seller finance, I can make the seller the bank. And the benefits for that seller is that they can defer taxes, they can make more money on their property over time, and it just maybe they just want to get monthly payments every single month instead of taking a big lump sum and getting hit with capital gains. So for subject to, which means subject to the existing mortgage, that is when I find a homeowner that is in some form of distress. And I go in and I negotiate terms with them saying, this is what I can do for you. And we make an agreement where I am going to now take ownership of that property, but I am going to leave the existing debt in their name. So now I can go out and own more properties with no debt in my name and have a lower entry fee with a much better and more favorable interest rate because of what we're experiencing right now with these high interest rates. Wow. So those are I, I like that. Yeah, great, great overview. And, you know, there's this so many different types of creative finance and we're, we're going to go deep into the seller finance and subject to, but there's also things like novations and lease options and arbitrage and pl plenty of different things. We won't go into that on this episode, um, but seller financing really gives you as a buyer, it benefits both the buyer and seller because, um, you know, like, like Jail mentioned, you know, you can defer taxes, you could give the seller the price that they're actually looking for, um, and you can give them monthly payments. And then the subject two, you can help them during the distress uh, situation. Maybe they're in the process of getting foreclosed on, maybe they're in a divorce and they really uh, need to get rid of this, liquidate this property. Um, so what I love about these creative options is you could, when you're meeting with a with a seller, you can give them different options. You could say, "Hey, you know, we can buy your property cash, um, or we can, you know, buy it on terms." So, what I, I know you spoke about the benefits, um, and we'll talk specifically about subject to for now. What what would you say is a benefit for 
both the seller and, and the buyer if somebody's going this route? So for the sellers, a lot of times we see that they cannot get the amount of money that they need to cover the cost of closing costs, selling, and paying agents commission. So for the seller, this can be a great option if they are now in arrears, meaning behind on some of their mortgage payments. I can come in as an investor and make that payment to the bank, close on the property, and now they do not have to worry about having the adverse effects of foreclosure for seven years credit score destroyed, and also a huge amount of debt that they probably won't ever be able to pay back. That also prevents you from getting the next housing because you have a foreclosure. So where are you going to live? So this is a great, great option for sellers who need to have something done quickly and to move on to the next phase in their life. We also give down payments and additional money to help them move to the next place, moving costs, and we still pay agents commission if they happen to broker the deal between us and the seller. Interesting. Right. So what, oh, sorry, I'm, I was going to jump in there, Nico, with that one, because you ahead. mentioned agents. And so I'm curious, and maybe Nico was going to go here, like a con with that, that I've run into is that so many agents don't understand it. Like I've seen like some big agents on social media be like, sub two is a scam, like don't do it. It's crazy. Like what, how do you combat those kinds of uh, naysayers when you're trying to promote the, the benefits of this kind of deal? So before we jumped on, I told Nico, I have a team of about 25 investors and some of them do direct to agent outreach and they use me as their credibility. They're like, it's not a scam. It's not illegal. This girl's on our team and she's having massive success. So what we do is we usually do a three-way call. We also send educational videos, frequently asked questions, and then we get on with them and the seller once they trust us and we close them. So it's really just explaining that this is not illegal. This is only a breach of contract for the seller and their mortgage company. It's nothing illegal about it. In every Alta you have, there's a small little line that says subject to yeah. on every single closing you've been to. So once we show them our Altas and the statements and how we close on the property, they're like, oh, the title company did it. It's definitely legal. <laughs> yeah. And just like, just like anything. If you don't understand it, you know, people are going to shut down. So most mm -hmm. agents, I know I didn't know this until, you know, I started coming to investor meetups and things like that, that that's a way that you can purchase properties. And, you know, one of the, one of the main benefits as a, as a buyer, if you're buying in subject to is, you know, there's no real credit check. You're not assuming this, 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 uh, mortgage, you are buying it subject to. So the mortgage will stay in their name, but you are getting uh, the title of the property. So. Uh, it's a benefit because you can benefit from the cash flow. You can benefit from the appreciation. Um, but you do want to work with people that understand it, especially, um, you know, find a settlement company, a title attorney that specialize uh, in, in these transactions. Because like you said, Jael, there's plenty of these transactions. They've been gone. I mean, you know, the, the concept of subject to is relatively new, but it's been going on for, you know, people have been doing this for quite some time. I love to ask people, how did people buy and sell real estate before agents and banks? Yeah. And they're like, it's by brokering a deal directly with the seller and the buyer. That is how real estate was purchased. And subject two was around then before we even had these, this ecosystem of real estate. That's right. I blame the banks. They advertise because they want people to use they them. To it's business. And that's what people have to realize is that, you know, at the end of the day, the bank will love to charge me way more on the money with these current interest rates where I want that 2% interest rate. Jael, can I ask you a question? So I know this subject too is, is very beneficial for somebody that's a buyer. Like you just mentioned, you just talked about interest rates, you know, three, four years ago when they were sub 3% and it's very appealing as a buyer, but what do, what do you say to, you know, the sellers that are concerned, Hey, what happens if something happens to you as the buyer and you can't pay my, my mortgage, what's going to happen to, to my property? What, what would you say if you have someone say that? Yeah. So the biggest thing is I always tell sellers, you also need to vet your buyer, make sure this is someone that does have money to maintain your payments and is going to actually help you and not hinder you. So I think that the biggest thing is assessing who you're doing this with. And we tell the buyers, I mean, the sellers all the time, we're improving your property. We've now paid down your mortgage. 
we've now increased your credit score and we have an asset that if we don't pay on it, you can take it back with all of those improvements. And I've already got you some more equity in this. You're out of foreclosure. It would be no disservice to you. Yeah. It wouldn't make sense for me to stop paying because now I'm into this property, maybe 50, 60 grand. Right. Would you say when you when you initially speak to these sellers, do you tell them the different options that you're planning on doing with the property, like fixing it up and get it rented or fixing it up and things like that? Or, you know, is that just depends on the conversation? Well, I don't always tell them how big my ROI is going to be. because they, <laughs> they, they want more Then they want more. That's true. Yeah, because if I can buy a property creatively and then increase my return on investment by making it a midterm rental that I'm charging three hundred and thirty dollars a day for. Don't really want to tell them that part, but I do give them a high level overview that we're going to re-rent this out, or it may be a strategy where we buy it subject to or creatively fix and flip it and then pay them out within the next six, seven months, which they love. When I'm all like, well, what happens if like the seller, like if the, if the seller like passes, like does it inherit so many questions, but what like, I feel like. Somebody the first oh, one oh, I did get the seller died. The guy I was talking about um that actually got us into okay. subject two was because it was a seller I couldn't help. He was underwater. We tried listing it, we tried selling it off the market, and it just would not work anyway with numbers. So we kept trying to research because we don't want to tell a seller no, we can't help you. He was 80 years old, found Pace Morby, saw him on bigger pockets. Mm -hmm. Joined the community at one of the most tumultuous times in our life where we were actually living in a hotel, had a really tragic event at our home. And it was like a leap of faith. Should we do this? And within our 30 days in the community, somebody helped us figure out, catch up his mortgage payments. We then found a tenant for the house to pay the monthly mortgage. So it was basically like a scenario where we found someone else that was in need and needed housing, but couldn't qualify as a tenant got them in, saved him in the mortgage. And that is how I found subject to and creative financing. And once we were able to help him and there was nobody that could help us figure out how to help him, that's when everything in my life changed. But I then said, he died. What happened? Then he died, right? Ooh. So this was about a year after owning the property. So the bank found out that he was dead through his then fiance. So we had to talk with them and say, look, we've been paying this mortgage for over a year. They were like, wait a minute, you closed on this property? So there is a thing called the due on sale clause. They, the bank can actually has the right to call that. We tell all of our sellers up front that this could possibly happen. Very rare, but we have attorneys in case it does. We didn't even have to get attorneys involved. We said, look, do you want us to keep paying it or we can stop? Up to you. They said, just keep making the payments. <laughs> really? Did they leave it in his name or did they transfer it over? Well, in his name to this day. What? That's crazy. Okay. That's, I mean, I guess that's the power of creativity, right? Like people think it's scary and impossible, but then you hear stories like this and the bank is willing to work with you if they don't have to foreclose on a property and try to resell it. The bank is not interested in holding and owning properties. They're interested in getting paid. Yep. Interesting. And, and okay. they're like, y'all have been making these on-time payments. Keep it going. Yeah, because I guess he had a history of being behind it anyway. And then at some point, yes. the, the whole account turned around and they're like, this is great. And then now they understood why. And they're like, just keep it going. Yep. So, That's Jail, I, I, I think we mentioned that um, the importance of agents understanding what, you know, what this is as, as a tool for your toolbox as an agent. Um, and one of the main reasons is because now we're, now we're at around seven, hovering around 7% interest rate, seven and a half, depending on uh, what, what you know, the buy, the buyers, you know, credit and things like that. Um, but, you know, two, three years ago when people refinance, they're all, they're at that 3% interest rate. And a lot of these people do need to move, but they're looking at, you know, when they sell their home, they become buyers. Um, and they're like, man, I'll just hold it. I'll ride the wave. I'll wait till interest rates drop so I can, and it's really becoming a shortage. So, you know, we thought that because the interest rates, you know, rose that the prices would drop a little bit. Um, but you, all three of us are in the DMV and we're not really, really seeing that they're still mm -hmm. up, you know, just, you know, the supply doesn't match the demand. Um, so question for you and, and for your team, is there something that you're doing to market to people that 
you know, you think need to sell that have these, you know, lower interest rates? Uh, is there something that you're doing to act actively go out as an agent, as an investor? Absolutely. So um, any what, what I recommend for this situation is if it's um, a homeowner that's going to have it as their primary residence, I would not necessarily sell them a creative deal. That is something I would sell to an investor that has a plan and knows exactly how they're going to make sure that they can make those payments because we don't want to put the seller that they're buying it from in a position. Now, a seller finance deal. Absolutely. Because there is no due on sale clause. There is no mortgage there. You're no negotiating directly with the homeowner. And if anything were to go awry, they can take back ownership of that property fairly quickly. So the one person and people that we market to most with these creative deals are people like ourselves that are independent contractors that cannot necessarily qualify for a bank loan. Two mm -hmm. years of employment, certain amount of money coming in. Even if we did try to apply, we could get the loan, but it's probably not for what we want because we write off so much of our income. Yep. Sure. So those are the deals that we push out to like people who are in the construction business that have mm -hmm. a lot of cash, but just can't qualify. So we call those wraps. That's where I get one with a very favorable interest rate and monthly payment. And I rewrap it to that investor with the down payment a higher interest rate and a little bit of higher of monthly payment and they own the property. I become the note holder. So those, Ooh. those are the ones we market and that's what, what we look for people who want to own a home, but cannot qualify through a bank. We'll have to uh, do another episode on wraps. And all. <laughs> <laughs> like so many yeah. more episodes that are going to happen. That's um, the fun part of creative financing. There's so many different ways you can, you can structure it. Um, it's up to your imagination. It's up yeah. to you. It's like how we were as children, being creative, thinking outside of the box. Yeah. Exactly. We'll have to have listeners, like as they're listening and watching the videos, like kind of comment, like what do they want to learn about next and do a deeper dive? Because yeah, we can go down this rabbit hole and spend hours here just talking about the different ways and stories and what if this and that and the other. So, so Jay, I have one more question. So you, you, you'll hear this and listeners probably have heard Pace Morby, you know, he's very big on the creative financing and he really leverages not going to get banks. I think you mentioned he's never gone to a bank to buy a property um, and you're part of his uh, subject to community, uh, sub to community. Um, he has a fantastic book out called Wealth Without Cash that I've uh, read a couple months back just just to get an idea of all the different ways that people are buying properties and selling properties. Um, what, what would you say, uh, you know, that community has helped you uh, with your agent and investing side? Wow. I mean, I, like I said, until I found that community, I didn't have any success in real estate. So I found that at the end of my, my first year, 20, December 2021. And since then, everything has taken off. Most of my referrals for even listings come out of that community. All of the agents, except for one on my team, are from the sub two community. It is a network of givers. It has changed me and my mother's lives, and I would not be able to hold 90 doors right now without that community. And even the lady who actually brought us that multifamily opportunity at the Bigger Pockets conference, she joined sub two. Yeah, it's the a space was there. It's a place where people are actually going to help you. And in this, sometimes in our real estate industry, guys, you can see it's a lot of cutthroat competition. But when you step into the sub two community, it's all helping hands. That's why I'm big on learning while you earn and then paying it forward because somebody helped me. Like that first deal I had, I had no contractual knowledge. I didn't know how to structure a sub two deal on paper. Somebody literally just said, hey, I'll do that for you. And we still made $10,000. So literally within my first 30 days of being in the community, I made all the money back that I spent plus some and somebody helped me understand how to structure that deal for free. Wow. wow. That's, that's amazing. So outside of the community, I know, well, I, I feel like investors are a lot more giving and forthcoming yes. with information than I'll say the regular real estate agent. No offense to any of you. Some of them are, <laughs> some real estate agents are great. They will help you along the way, but yeah. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> that won't. So, so aside from the uh, sub two community, obviously that you have joined, uh, like if someone were starting out in this area, you talked about learning and things like that. Like, what other resources would you recommend someone utilize if they wanted to start on this path of learning about creative financing? I definitely would say um, consume a lot of YouTube videos. Just figure out 
what you need to understand and move forward. And then the biggest thing is relationships. So once you do say, okay, I do want to do something creative, find somebody that's part of the community that can help you understand. He tells us all the time, help other people that are not in this community structure deals. So that's something that we are tasked with. And just like Nico said, I read Wealth Without Cash all the time. There's still things I go back in that book for to learn. He gives you from A to Z, how to find the deal, how to wholesale, the different types of creative, how to talk to sellers, what are the frequently asked questions, how to structure your business after you do get big enough to do that. It's all right there from beginning to end. But a lot of things I learned, guys, is from reading books. I average about 15 books a year. It's really important. That's how right. about local hey. meetups? Yeah. And the local th- meetups. <laughs> we, we, we are meetup hoppers. Like, we go to so. You got to You got to be in the community. The I think our first episode and it was the power of community and and yeah. how you know we're part of the Cashflow Breakfast Club. Sub two. Great uh, community. I, I'm I'm part of RPM, which is Chad Carson's uh, uh, community. And you want to be with people that are having the the same conversations, especially if you want to look into the subject too and seller financing. You want to mm-hmm. be with a community that's doing it. They've seen it. Pace Morby has seen everything. He he prides himself on. If if there's a deal that he can't solve, then then uh, then he'll pay you or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So so you want to be having that conversation with um with people and and being with people that are doing it, and that's why you know that's the main reason why Anna and I started this podcast is to learn from people like yourself and and talk about uh, what we're learning and give it out to the audience for free. Hopefully they're you know enjoying the knowledge and things like that. So. Some of our most high level connections have come from the Cash Flow Breakfast Club. Uh, that was the first meetups that we were going to and the community that really kicked us off into real estate. So the meetups are everything. Awesome. Yes. Yes. And a lot of these are at no cost because I know I've had people ask me, like, why does someone like like Omni, who's Cash Flow Breakfast Club, or you guys, like, why would someone do all of this for free? And it's like part of it is the giving spirit. Like if you, if you give it out, you're going to get it back in return in some way, shape, or form. So I love Lead it. With value. Lead yes. without you and everything else to come. People will respect you more like, wow, you helped me. Some people you won't mm-hmm. even ever know that you helped them just from something you said. So this podcast is going to be instrumental in helping agents and investors take it to the next level. Yay. Exactly. Yeah, the go-giver mentality is important. That's actually one of Omni's prerequisites in order to, uh, you know, be a chapter leader. I'm the chapter leader in in, in uh, Montgomery County. Is that you need to read that book, The Go Giver, where it mm-hmm. talks about giving value, giving value to to people, and um, eventually, I mean, I'm summarizing it, but eventually it'll come back mm-hmm. and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. So this has been extremely awesome, JL. Where where can people learn a little bit more about you and connect with you about your journey in real estate as an agent, as well as an investor? Absolutely. So anyone can connect with me on YouTube. My channel is underscore J A E L dot Thomas T H O M A S invest, buy and sell with Jael. I, I do my best to provide as much information on there as possible. Case studies, um, a video about exit strategies is coming out and just showing you guys from beginning to end some of the deals I've done. So that's what you can expect that's coming next. Um, And also on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, I want all of it, same name. And I can't wait to help out as many people as I can. I can't wait to hear from you all. That's awesome. And then if you're local, and I don't know if this is not open to everyone, you can tell me to be like, no, stop talking. Like if you're local to... If you're open, if you're in the DMV, like, what about, talk about that. Like, what do you guys got going on every month that yeah. someone may be able to join? Yeah, guys. So my mom and I, Stacy Thomas, she's the regional leader for DC, Maryland, and Virginia of the sub two community. We host a sub two meetup at the last Saturday of every single month at Glory Days Grill, super accessible, great parking, and you can eat. So we have guest speakers. We have a panel where we do Q&A, and it's always a different topic. Last week, it was private money lending. This week, it's about commercial real estate. And we always tie in creative strategies as well. Also, since she's become the DMV's regional leader, we make sure that we have meetings all the way from Arbutus, Maryland, down to Hampton, Virginia. So there are so many places where you can plug in. I want it to be simple for you guys and as close to you as possible. So 
Sub2.com has all of the upcoming meetups. And we also have our stuff on meetup and some people use Eventbrite. Awesome. So everybody needs to find you, connect with you online, send you messages, heart, whatever. I Just... post a lot. So you'll <laughs> see the meetups. <laughs> and I think you mentioned another another event that you were talking about. Uh, you mind sharing uh, the yes. that last event? Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the space to do this, guys. I'm doing an initiative that's very near and dear to my heart. My uncle Ron Russ was the director of the Alexandria Boys and Girls Club for 30 years before he passed. And it's a nonprofit organization and they are in need of so many things. We have a wish list where we've actually almost gotten half of everything we've asked for to help the facility. We also have sponsors and collecting donations. And on May 31st, um, we're hosting a carnival day for the children that are there and the sponsors that have helped out so that they can enjoy themselves before the summer. And the donations and sponsorships are going towards their field trips and materials because we also have a couple of great contractors that have offered to do free labor to uplift the vibe of the facility. That's amazing. And if someone wants to help out and contribute, like what's the best way to do that? Is it to um, message you or? Yes. Yeah, so if they find me on social media, Facebook, YouTube, it's on all of the platforms, the wish list link, as well as the sponsorship. And definitely guys, feel free to DM me and um, reach out my phone number 703-220-8306. Just sharing this information is even a big help. We appreciate every single act of kindness. I love and it. We, We're sharing it on social media. <laughs> Thank <laughs> That's you. Right. We appreciate you coming on. That's going to wrap up today's episode of the Agent to Investor podcast. Please like, share, subscribe. If you found any value from today's episode, we encourage all the feedback. Um, my name is Nico Garcia and Garcia on all social platforms. And, and uh, you want to share your? Oh, time. yeah, because you can never say my last name. <laughs> it's Anna you, Bilek. You know <laughs> I'm Anna Bilek at underscore realtor on most social platforms. But honestly, if you just put in Anna Bilek, B-I-A-L-E-K, you will find it. I'm the girl with the glasses and the purple hair. So you can't miss me. Love it. Love it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until the next time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.